You're listening to the Hog Sports Network Daily Podcast. Now, here's your host, Matt Jones. Hey, happy Tuesday to you. We appreciate you being with us. We got a lot to get to today on our podcast. We'll talk with Tip Souza a little bit later about Razorback football. Still plenty to discuss about the Razorback basketball exhibition against Kansas last Friday night. To help us do that, we've got Seth Greenberg from ESPN. He was there Friday night serving as the uh, court reporter. Seth, we appreciate you being here. Glad to be here. Uh, you know, it was fun. Great atmosphere, great energy. Obviously, the John Calipari era kicked off with a lot of enthusiasm and uh, a really impressive performance considering they've had all these injuries all preseason. When you see an arena on October 25th with 20,000 people in it for an exhibition game, I mean, what are your thoughts? Uh, my thoughts are that people are passionate about college basketball and the Hogs, you know, and that's just the way it is. And John Calipari wasn't going to go somewhere where they weren't passionate about college basketball. I mean, he's going to go to a place where people have ownership, care, are invested. Uh, and that's why I think one of the reasons, you know, he wasn't going to leave Kentucky for a place that he didn't think he could create that same energy, that same passion, that same ownership, that same enthusiasm uh, that he's had since, you know, he started it, you know, at UMass. But what he was able to do at Memphis, uh, rebuilding that thing, the Success he had at Kentucky, and you know, obviously Kentucky is a place that has great passion for basketball. But so does Arkansas, and Arkansas has got a championship pedigree, and it's got a you know a great fan base. And uh, I, that was actually my open. I said, you know, it's incredible. It's October twenty fifth, and <clears throat> there's just under twenty thousand people here, and they are all in. They weren't there to spectate; they were there to participate, which was pretty cool. Jimmy Dykes a couple of times on the broadcast, he made a point. He said he thinks that it's going to be like a Rick Barnes to Tennessee situation where. He said he thinks Arkansas is going to get the very best version of John Calipari. I think you've been around him some during the offseason, right? I mean, I, I wonder just kind of what have, what's what been your impression about how he feels about this job, and, and, and maybe does he look, does he sound any different than he has in the past? Yeah, we've been friends for 48 years, and uh, we're you know I, I have so much respect for John, just what he does, how he does it, the passion he has for it. He doesn't have to coach anymore. He's done everything you could do. He's in the Hall of Fame. He coaches because he loves it. He wants to impact on people's lives. He wants to, you know, build something and create an energy and uh, and do something special. Uh, so uh, he's more like I I, I told him, uh, you know, he's got a joy about him. He, you know, it, this business is really hard. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I did it for thirty three years, and if you're not on the same page as your administration, it becomes that much harder. I think he's really excited to be on the same page with the administration. They have a shared vision. He's got a tremendous support of the people you need to have the support of in the community. That's the everyday fans and also, obviously, the people that can impact NIL, which is pay for play. It's not NIL. It's not calling what it isn't. Uh, and, uh, you know, I would say joy, excited, enthusiastic. Now, look, he burns the candle at both ends. He flies to New York to watch the Yankees last night. <laughs> I mean, the guy is in constant motion. He's like, a, he's like a good small forward. You know, he's always moving. He's changing direction. He's changing speed. But he still connects with young people. <clears throat> and I think the greatest testament to that is look at the number of former players who basically entrusted their kid's career in his hands. And, and to me, that's the greatest compliment a coach can get is to coach someone and then want that person to want their child to play for my coach. And uh, and I think that's pretty cool. And, uh, you know, to me, that's there's a little a legacy going on, whether – no matter where it was. I mean, I have Lou Rowe there the other day, one of his first recruits at UMass, <clears throat> you know, to have, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, Wani there, you know, supporting his son, to have, you know, all the guys that were there to wanting to be part of his first game at Arkansas was really cool. You were here back in January for college game day, uh, ironically enough for an Arkansas-Kentucky game. Calipari was on the other sideline. Uh, I don't know how fair of a question is, but but does the does does it feel different around here when you came back nine months ago? I know there's a different coaching staff, so it's going to feel different. But maybe can you put into words what what the feeling how it's changed? You know, Must did a great job. He really did. I mean, you know, he had tremendous success. Uh, but yeah, I mean, John Calipari's Ringling brother, Brothers, Bonner and Belly. That's what he is. Hmm. I mean, he he brings the circus to town. I mean, he's just he's a magnet. He has that ability to touch people. Uh, he has the ability to create a, a consensus and a, a shared experience. Um, you know, he has an energy that is relentless. Like he'll do more in the next four or five or six years, whatever it is, 
in the community for that state than he'll probably do even for the basketball program. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the thing that no one really kind of gave Cal credit for. You know, if there was ever a tragedy in the state of Kentucky, all right, he was raising money for it. He was on the front lines. He was building homes. He was doing marathons. He was doing the things that a leader, a servant leader, should do, use their celebrity to positively impact others. So that's just that's just who he is. It's what he's always been. You got to remember now, you know, he's obviously been very successful. You know, his mom worked in the cafeteria. His dad slung, you know, slung bit bags at, you know, Eastern Airlines in the Pittsburgh airport. I coached mm-hmm. at Pitt. <clears throat> and I know his dad really, really well. I mean, you know, he comes from a very, very uh, marginal background, but he always had a vision uh, and he had the ability to, you know, create a, a, a consensus of, of passion uh, with people. Uh, you know, just, I mean, watching those guys play the other day, I mean, you know, you know, just seeing uh, with limited practice time, they've had limited practice. They've had five and six guys in practice. I was shocked. Uh, and more importantly, I was shocked how they defended because excluding the last probably 10 minutes, they were pretty connected defensively. They had good pressure on the basketball. Now, look, that wasn't the best version of Kansas. That's a different team with Hunter Dickinson and Ryland Griffin. I mean, just calling it what it is. But it's also a different team with Arkansas when, you know, you can have a dude being able to play 30 minutes instead of 15 minutes and Jonas Adu being able to play 20 minutes or 25 minutes. And now all of a sudden you've got Brazil, you've got Z, and you've got Jonas. You can play two bigs together or you can play one of the bigs. You can play, you know, Adu at four. You can play him at some at three. Uh, and then, you know, Boogie is just – I mean, he's he's uh, he's got a little he's got a little Kyrie Irving in him is what I what I see in this game. I mean, he's he's pretty special. You mentioned during the broadcast, you said city guards are different, and when you said that, my mind automatically went back way back. Kareem Reed at Arkansas, yeah, uh, came out came All out of the Bronx, yeah, and uh, you know, so kind of explain that to people what what you see from Boogie Fland and and, and that city guards comment. He's got an edge. He's fearless. He wants to challenge. Uh, he wants the ball. Uh, he uh, he's got a shake to his game. Uh, now he's continuing to learn how to make plays better for others, and that's the next step in his game. And I thought he was pretty good at that the other day. Mm-hmm. But uh, he can get to a spot. He can create the separation. He has that little fade on a little step back. He shot the one off the one foot. He's got different ways to finish at the rim, which is really really important. Uh, and you know the success he had. You know, like I grabbed him after the game. I know his high school coach really well. And I said, this is just the beginning. Like for all the, for, for the Arkansas fans, for these players, this is the baseline. Like what you saw the other day on the 25th should be the baseline. This is the very beginning. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you know, anyone can do something once. The great teams do it consistently. They defended for about 25 minutes with a really good purpose. They lost their defensive focused the last 15 minutes. He gave up straight line drives. They gave up baseline drives. They got beat on the glass. Uh, they got to get a little bit more intentional in terms of being strong with the basketball or pursuing the ball off the glass. But uh, it was a great starting point. And uh, it was exactly what John needed to create, you know, a what if mindset for these, you know, rabid fans. With Fland and DJ Wagner, um, Nelly DJ Davis. was great. That's about that. That I would. I don't think I've. I know DJ's whole family, and you know his dad, just a you know great guy. I mean, mm-hmm. and and DJ handled a very difficult situation because his ankle was banged up, lost a little confidence. Reed had a monster year, and I, I I did a ton of those games, and you know what? Every single time Reed did something well, the first guy off the bench was DJ. The- I mean. It is so easy to root for him, and he's put in the work with Kenny Payne late at night getting shots up. Uh, it, it was so cool to see him play with a burst and with force and with pace and confidence. Uh, that was a lot of fun for me. Bill Self said that he didn't think that he was going to see another backcourt that good the rest of the season. I mean, what, what, what's the ceiling for this group? I don't I, you know. This is October, whatever it is today. I mean, ceiling is get better today. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, how good can they be? Yeah, they're going to be better. I mean, they've got to be better because that league is an absolute, you know, just rock fight every single night. I'm, I've seen Alabama. I've seen Auburn. Uh, you know, already I've seen Ole Miss. I was uh, saw Kentucky a little bit when I did Reed's camp. I've seen Arkansas. There are no rocking chair games in this league. So it's not where you're at now. It's really how do you deal with adversity? How do you get to the next play? 
Do you stay as a team? Do you commit to getting better every single day? Do you have a resiliency about you that when you play back-to-back road games, maybe you get bopped. How do you respond? Mm -hmm. Do you point fingers or do you come together? So, I mean, they're going to be a good team. I'm going to be good. If if the arrow is healthy, he is as tough a matchup as there is in the country. He can rebound. He's physical. He's strong. uh, He can grab a defensive rebound, initiate your fast break. You you saw the ridiculous catch and dunk he made the other day. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and, and Trev in Brazil, I mean, you know, I, I was really, you know, he was an if to me, but he seems like he's totally bought in. So when you have those three bigs, if they do can get, if Jonas can get healthy, uh, you know, where he can play 20 minutes a game, he, that's a big body, make a jump hook, shoot an elbow jumper, get an offensive rebound. Uh, they've got a, a pretty versatile roster. I wanted to ask you real quick, you know, so there's a lot of uh, emphasis on who Kansas didn't have, but they did have Dewan Harris out there. And uh, it seemed like Boogie Fland held his own pretty well against a, a really good defender in, in Harris. Was that surprising to see this early on? Well, started the game, they had Zeke Mayo on on, on Boogie and they had okay. they had Dewan on, on DJ. DJ played really well. It was kind of a surprise because they were playing DJ off the ball. So mm-hmm. they were advanced passing to him and letting him go and make plays. And Boogie had to bone his hands more. Uh, no, he, he's a confident, you know, look, Don Harris is a terrific player. He's one of my favorite players. He, uh, you know, but he, what, you know, when you take, when you take Rylan Griffin off the court, you take that big ball screen in the middle of the floor off the court, mm-hmm. uh, it, it changes him. But, you know, like what I said before about Boogie, he can get the ball anywhere he wants, anytime he wants. He can create separation. He's got that little fade. He's got different ways to finish. He's good in ball screens. He'll rescreen it if they go under it. If you go under, he'll knock down the jumper. You know, that's what I talk about being city guard. I mean, he's got a really good feel for for how to play and take advantage. You know, like the whole thing is everyone talks about ball screens and dribble handoffs and zoom actions. It, it's not the action. It's taking, reading the action and then making a play. And he has a really, really good feel for seeing it. I call it sighting, sighting a play and then making the right play. Real quick, uh, Coach Cal said that he asked Bill Self not to play zone defense so they don't have their zone offense installed or they, they had not had it installed as of Friday night. Kind of take us in time or inside this time of year as a coach. And uh, how, did, how do these installations work? How long does that take? Uh, you know, they're a little bit behind schedule because they have a bunch of guys. They'll keep their zone offense really skip, simple, playing in gaps and spacing and screen the top of it a little bit, maybe inside screen the middle against the 2-3 zone. But, uh, yeah, they'll be addressing that in special situations. I think the biggest thing is, you know, so the great thing about the scrimmage and playing quarters is you had those end-of-clock situations. Mm-hmm. You know, four seconds, but you had a chance to go for full court. He shouldn't have passed it. He should have got to a spot and jumped up and shot, shoot it. Um, you know, they had a couple where they could – they had one where they could have gone two for one and it was like 45 seconds left. You get it in quick, you can bust it up the court, get a quick two for one. If, if it's 42 or less, then, you know, you might want to, in the first half, let it bounce around. Don't have to pick it up right away. The clock's running. So they got to get into that. I thought they defended underneath out of bounds pretty well. And Kansas is really good in their underneath out of bounds stuff. Now, they were in their cluster stuff where it's just constant movement and a screen and then get it reversed. But, uh, yeah, I mean, there, there are a lot of things to do. I mean, but they're not going to be a finished product. Those early games, by the way, you know, Central's John Schulman is a terrific coach mm-hmm. and they'll run all that Princeton stuff as will Lipscomb. I mean, those, those games will challenge your defensive discipline. I'll put you on the spot a little bit here. Uh, they played TCU Friday night, Jamie Dixon at TCU. They've been to three straight NCAA tournaments. Obviously he's got a, a great resume. What do you know about the Horn Frogs and what Arkansas might see down there in Fort Worth? They're going to see speed. Jamie Dixon's teams play at warp speed. They bring it on you at, you know, in two seconds. Actually, when they get a rebound to getting it up the floor, a little bit like Alabama, in terms of how quickly they bring it on you, they're going to have to guard the basketball and they're going to have to rebound. I mean, really, that's what – when you play Jamie Dixon's team, you better rebound the ball, you better guard the basketball, and you better set your defense. And then defensively, they're going to be more in a pack line, in gaps, not really taking stuff away so those driving lanes won't be as easy. There'll be a lot of guys scraping down when guys try to get in the lane. So now you got to really spray it and maybe make one more to get the shot you want. Can't, ball can't get stuck when teams play in gaps. How often do you think college game day might feature Arkansas? 
I have no idea. It's way above my pay grade. <laughs> okay. I just I just go where they tell me to go. I have a feeling you might be there February first. Uh, Calipari's return back to Rupp wouldn't, wouldn't be a surprise. Yeah. Well, here's the deal. That's the same day that Duke plays North Carolina. Is it really? Okay. Wow. Yeah, that's that two. Might, that, that, that might be a problem. Yeah. Two heavyweight games that day. We, 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 we could do a game day there and fly to Duke, North Carolina. Who knows? I mean, that, you know, that's a long way away. They got a lot of, a lot of work to do. Uh, it's going to be fun to watch. If they can get healthy, then, you know, you can't get better unless you're in shape. And then once you're in shape, you got to stay healthy. Yeah. So, you know, get healthy, get in great shape. Like I thought Z's got to get in better shape. There are guys that have to get in better shape. You know, it's hard. They're playing against the GAs. You know, you, you, you're afraid of having more injuries. So uh, he'll get him going. He'll get him in good shape. But I think that the success they had obviously makes it really easy to get back in the gym and, and do it again. Seth, you've been great with your time. Appreciate it. Great. Thanks, guys. All right, Seth Greenberg of ESPN. When we come back, Chip Souza will be with us. We'll talk Razorback basketball and more Razorback football. But first, a word from our sponsors. Want to enjoy your life again? Burning, numbness, and general pain in your feet and legs might be keeping you from your daily activities. Neuropathy treatment can be effective to restoring your life. Come see what we can do at Enhanced Healthcare Wellness Institute in Uptown Rogers. We can treat your neuropathy pain and get you back in the game of life. Enhanced Healthcare Wellness Institute is located at 5102 West Pauline Whitaker Parkway in Uptown Rogers. At Kendall King, we're proud of over four decades of design. We're continuing the legacy of great creative design by combining our brands of Kendall King, Soapbox, and Shopcart. Together, these brands represent a new focus in marketing design with individual attention to specific areas. Through our design expertise supported by a team of talented professionals, we showcase our best. We are Kendall King, we are Soapbox, we are Shopcart, we are design. Hey, welcome back. I want to tell you about our friends at Enhanced Healthcare Wellness Institute. They are your source for holistic wellness and your healthy lifestyle changes. Located in Uptown Rogers, the staff at Enhanced Healthcare will target your specific plan for wellness from neuropathy treatment, primary care, weight loss, and so much more. You can count on the experts at Enhanced Healthcare Wellness Institute in Rogers. Just a little bit north of Rogers now, Chip Souza joins us from home this morning. Uh, Chip, appreciate you being here. As you can see, I've got my my backyard back there. Leaves are falling, man. This is my time of year. You're going to be out on the deck, and uh, the wind's howling a little bit too much today. It's it. Yeah, it's, it, I'm it's fighting been whipping this the last couple of days. Battle with leaves. I mean, I get them blown <laughs> off my front porch, and like 15 minutes later, they're back. And like, oh, come on, man. Oh yeah, I, I picked up my my girls at their daycare yesterday, and just the you know the 10 15 minutes they've got the doors open as the parents are coming down. I mean, the entire lobby was full of leaves. Yeah. It's just that time of year. Uh, yeah. You were at Bud Walton the other night uh, for Arkansas Thanks. and Kansas. Uh, but what was it like being in there? Well, I mean, for a game, again, for a game that didn't mean anything, um, like in the standings, like the win and loss record or whatever, um, you know, to have 17,000, 18,000 there, um, that just tells you how excited, you know, people are uh, for John Calipari and and this season to start. Um, you know, it was, it was, and it, it, I loved it. The atmosphere was great. And I don't know if, if you talked to, to, um, to Anthony or, 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 or maybe Ethan about this earlier in the week, but, um, they had these wristbands that fans wore during the mm-hmm. game. And so when you got, we got there early, of course, because we knew it was just going to be insane trying to park and, you know, all that. Um, and I saw these, you know, these bands on the seats, I know what they were for. And then, you know, then the fans put them on and somehow or another, they and I'm not, you can tell I'm just real techno savvy, you know. Uh, but but somehow, somewhere, they controlled the patterns of the LED lights on these wristbands mm-hmm. and they made them red and blue and white and whatever. And it was the, the like, it was one of the coolest things I've ever seen. It's like being at a Coldplay concert, yeah. And uh, even Calipari mentioned it, you know, in the post game, he was like, you know, I don't know where that came from or whatever, but man, it was, he, it was really cool. You know, I've mentioned this. I feel like Arkansas has been behind a lot of other schools in terms of some of these, you know, in game engagement type features, you know, like you see these stadiums now where they've got the led lights and they're blinking after touchdowns. Uh, saw where Kentucky just put in an led basketball floor, at Rupp Arena, uh, they did some. They can do some really cool things with that. Uh, Ole Miss has got this feature. I, I don't know exactly what they use, uh, but but their pregame in Oxford is just phenomenal, especially uh, when they were whenever they're able to do it at night. And so I mentioned this about 
I don't know, maybe two weeks ago that I thought Arkansas was behind. And then, uh, sure enough, that weekend, they had a drone show at the homecoming yeah. game against oh, yeah, LSU. That was, awesome. that was that was pretty cool to see. Uh, now you got this. So they're getting there. Um, yeah. These are the types of things that people keep people engaged and, and wanting to come to a basketball game or a football game because, I mean, like it or not, the the people who are who are getting to or coming of age as ticket buyers maybe the best way to put it you've got to give them more than just the product on the field or on the court that that's just how it is yeah anything that enhances the fan experience is a good thing uh they're already paying a lot of money for tickets a lot of money to buy a drink you know at the concession stand um so anything that, that you can give them that makes them feel like their money is going uh, farther, you know, they're getting more for that, that money that they're laying out is, is a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I mean, I was at a high school game the other day, three bottles of water, a Skittles and an M&M $13. And that's <laughs> cheap compared to what you're doing, uh, at, 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 uh, college games, uh, and yeah. even cheaper, you know, it's even more expensive once you get into the pros, John Calipari had his first, uh, live radio show last night, uh, and he wasn't there. I think this is we're, we're going to have to get used to the fact that this is just a, a different kind of uh, coach that we're dealing with with Arkansas. He yeah. was he said he was calling in from Brian Cashman's office inside Yankee Stadium. He was there with his son wow. Brad uh, for Game Three of the World Series last night between the Dodgers and the Yankees. He said that it was the team's day off, and so he took it as an opportunity to go recruit in the Northeast. And while they were in the Northeast, they decided to stop by Yankee Stadium and uh, see the Yankees play the Dodgers last night. We got a few clips, though, from the show. Calipari, a couple from him. He called in for the first segment, and then Kenny Payne was in attendance toward the end. Uh, this is what Calipari had to say about the atmosphere and about the attendance for the game against Kansas the other night. Pretty interesting. Listen. And can you imagine 20,000 people come to an exhibition game, and they pay? Was it like freebie? You got to pay a thousand students camped out for two days for the opportunity to get into an exhibition game on October 25th, which was like, what in the world? But it's a statement that this is what this program means. John Calipari last night on uh, his uh, radio show, which was uh, from Sassy, that clip from. Uh, Hogs Plus, we appreciate uh, them for allowing us to use that. Uh, the passion for the basketball team, not every, and, and there are very few programs, I feel like, that are going to be able to attract a John Calipari away from the type of job that he had at Kentucky, regardless of, of whatever was going on there behind the scenes and, and how uncomfortable it might have been. Uh, this was a good way, I think, for Arkansas to solidify, hey, you you made the choice, at least in terms of coming to a program that really cares. Well, Matt, let's let's contrast the two coaches here. You have, you know, Calipari leaves Kentucky, obviously the blue a blue blood, maybe the bluest of blue bloods um, in college basketball. And a lot of people who maybe don't know, haven't followed college basketball for a long time, they would view that as him going from Kentucky to Arkansas as a step down, at least in terms of perception and national uh, awareness of, of programs. W we know that's not the case. He He's used to things like this. Arkansas has always embraced its basketball program, going back to the 70s with Eddie Sutton and whatever. And I give Calipari credit for realizing that Leaving Kentucky to come here is anything but a step down. And that that attendance and that enthusiasm last Friday night only backs that up, okay? Let's take Eric Musselman, who leaves here, and, and, it, what, and what he did here was fantastic, and he leaves here to go to L.A. I mean, L.A., big L.A., you know, the you know, third or fourth, second, whatever largest you know, city in the country – he has an exhibition game and there's four people there. I mean, you know, I mean, there's a few more than that, but not many. So it just kind of contrasts the difference in, you know, Eric left here to go to a big city that's a pro town, hard for college teams to, to draw well there. And Arkansas has 20,000 or 17,000, whatever it was, at an exhibition game. And it, and it wasn't just any exhibition game for Southern Cal either. It was Gonzaga. 
They beat Gonzaga yeah, in Gonzaga, front of an announced yeah. 2,190 people the other night. So, and, and that was probably not that many there either. Now, to, you know? yeah, I, I will say this for Southern Cal. It was not at their home campus. They played it uh, at a neutral site in Southern California, but still, I mean, it's – your your point is uh, it is well taken. Calipari was asked by Chuck Barrett uh, during the show last night. Uh, basically, he said, uh, "We got the clip coming here in just a second. But basically, he asked, "You've had a few days to digest what happened during the the Kansas game. You've you've had some time uh, to look at the film. So, you know, what was the difference between uh, maybe what you saw Friday night and after some time to review this, uh, what you saw." you know, on film. And uh, this is what Calipari had to say about that last night on his show. Well, the first half, I was, I was kind of stunned that we didn't have more turnovers. Uh, the second half, we got sloppy, especially down the stretch, really sloppy. But I think it would be, we were just exhausted. Um, we had not, I know people are not going to believe this. We had not scrimmaged one time this season because when we were healthy early early we just didn't get to that point and then for the last two weeks two and a half three weeks almost we had five players so we did everything in breakdowns we did everything playing against GAs we did all those kind of things so I didn't know what to expect we had three players that played 15 to 18 minutes that we did not expect to play TB Adu, and Nelly. And so without really practicing, they played some. Um, and, you know, so we had those starters didn't have to try to play the whole game. Again, John Calipari on his show last night from uh, from Hogs Plus. It, it, I was surprised, Chip, that they played as well as they did out, out of the gate. I, I think, and, and you'll hear Kenny Payne say this here in, in, in just a minute too, I think everybody was a little bit taken aback that Arkansas played this well, even even with KU being without players. Uh, you know, they, they haven't had a team for a, a very long time just in terms of having enough players out there to, to even practice. Uh, th- th- this was an impressive performance, I, I, I feel like. Yeah, I, I, Matt, I don't know that they even today still have enough players to really have a full-on scrimmage. I don't think they practice. got enough for five-on-five five yet. Yeah, I think he uh, Cal said uh, that they basically have been scrimmaging play against GAs, uh, you know, the last, you know, trying to get ready. Um, Their GAs know, the thing, are a little bit different. Like, like they've got they got better GAs. Than most yeah, programs. Yeah. yeah, they don't have me out there, you know, no. uh, running plays against them. You know, it's it's they, they you're right, they are better. Um, you know, I I, I was t- I learned a long time ago, Matt, that, that if you have good guard play, you, you, your team your team has a chance to be really good. And man, they they have terrific guard play. Uh, uh, Boogie Flan, uh, Wagner, uh, Dave. I mean, those those guys can go, and and they really they really complement one another. Now, Davis didn't play um, as many minutes the other night as Wagner and Flan did. Uh, he's kind of trying to get back from injury too, so he didn't play as many minutes. But that that dude's just a dog, man. He he's you know he is a scrapper. He is a do whatever it takes uh, kind of a player. He's he may be not going to fill up the stat sheet like like Boogie will and, and DJ can, but it's, he's going to do the, the things that that good teams have to have done. He, he's going to do those, die, you know, dive on the floor, try to lock down the other team's best guard. Those are the things he's going to excel at. And man, Cal, he's got the guards. I mean, he he really has he really has them. Kenny Payne was on the Calipari show last night. Uh, after Calipari, John L. Davis was also there. Uh, they had a question and answer session from the crowd and someone asked him about, you know, just his analysis of the KU game. And and he gave a a really good analysis here. I did not expect our speed and athleticism to put Kansas on their heels. Um, And that's not a coaching thing. There's a group of players versus another group of players. And they're seeing the tenacity, the athleticism, the speed of, our guard play and the length of our bigs and they're like whoa they weren't used to that um i would say we are going to have to live by that uh and that's hard to do because uh at times you have mental lapses so there was a point in the game when 
in the fourth quarter, we were up 15, and you can see we were sort of mentally losing focus. Uh, you can't lose focus. If we're going to be one of those teams, and we're we're trying to be one of those teams, and it's going to be a process, we have to shock people with how hard we play. We're going to have to shock people, yes, with our athleticism, but the number one thing, passing the basketball. When everybody on the court passes the basketball, I did not say shoot it. Just touch it and pass it to the next guy. Then there's the chemistry that happens. If two people score 30 and the rest of the three don't really get shots and they're not passing the ball, then we're all getting phone calls from parents and agents and saying, oh, my God, what is this? So we have to make sure that we get these kids to understand how important it is to play together. I was so impressed listening to Kenny Payne. I mean, you can tell that guy, regardless of whether it was successful or not, and, and it, it was not at Louisville, uh, that guy has, has got the, the the poise of a head coach. And, and even more than that, though, just his way to communicate, I, I thought was uh, – you can see why he's he's such a good assistant coach. Uh, he's got very good communication skills, and that's half the battle with the coach. He laid it out there in the very simplest of terms and what they're going to have to do to be successful. They're, that's the formula for them to be successful. He laid it out there in very, very simple, easy to understand words. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was I was impressed listening to him. I have a feeling we're going to get to know these assistant coaches quite a bit through through Coach Cal's radio show. He yeah. Calipari strikes me as the type who he I think at this point in his life and his career. He doesn't want to be out there as the face of the program at all times. He knows, you know, he knows what his role is, but he wants the players to be out there. He wants his assistant coaches. Uh, and so I, I have a feeling we're going to learn a lot about his program, uh, not only through this radio show, but but through a lot of the different media uh, availabilities they do this year. You know, from what I've heard from the people of Kentucky, he doesn't do game previews. He'll talk to the media after the game, but you're probably going to hear from his assistant coaches before the game. So Kind of an interesting, uh, it, it, it's a different way than I think we're used to. Uh, but at the same time, it gives you a lot of unique voices and perspectives. And uh, so it's going to be interesting as we go along through this first season, just kind of learning about Calipari's program uh, and, and how it's different from what we've seen in the past. Chip, stay there. When we come back, we're going to talk about Razorback football, lots of injury updates, uh, some personnel notes. A couple of tight ends have been uh, dismissed from the team. Lots to get to as we talk about what Sam Pittman had to say Monday during his weekly news conference, but first, another word from our sponsors. Want to enjoy your life again? Burning, numbness, and general pain in your feet and legs might be keeping you from your daily activities. Neuropathy treatment can be effective to restoring your life. Come see what we can do at Enhanced Healthcare Wellness Institute in Uptown Rogers. We can treat your neuropathy pain and get you back in the game of life. Enhanced Healthcare Wellness Institute is located at 5102 West Pauline Whitaker Parkway in Uptown Rogers. At Kendall King, we're proud of over four decades of design. We're continuing the legacy of great creative design by combining our brands of Kendall King, Soapbox, and Shopcart. Together, these brands represent a new focus in marketing design with individual attention to specific areas. Through our design expertise supported by a team of talented professionals, we showcase our best. We are Kendall King. We are Soapbox. We are Shopcart. We are design. Hey, welcome back. We want to tell you about our friends at Bentonville Glass. They have been serving their community since 1971. Committed, professional, versatile. If you're looking for a quality leader in Northwest Arkansas or looking for skilled craftsmanship, choose Bentonville Glass for all your glass market needs with the highest quality products. You can come by and see them now at 507 South Main in Bentonville or online at bentonvilleglass.com. Sam Pittman spoke to the media on Monday Lots of updates. The big news coming out of the uh, news conference was that the Razorbacks are going to be uh, down a couple of tight ends now. Uh, Varkias Gums and Ty Washington have both been dismissed from the team uh, for a, a violation of team rules. No more um, uh, uh, no more information given other than that. But uh, Arkansas, they had a couple of really good tight ends the other day uh, in Luke Kaz and, and Andreas Pasca. Uh, down at Starkville, and, and they're going to need them to continue to produce because now a position of strength has become a position, or at least of depth, has become a position uh, maybe with not so much depth. 
Jaquinta Jackson is going to probably be listed as doubtful for this weekend's game against Ole Miss. Sam Pittman said that he thinks uh, Jackson will be available uh, for the final three games, beginning with the Texas game on November the 16th. Uh, lots of other personnel notes that we'll get to here in just a minute. I found Pittman's um, comments about the defense to be interesting because, to me, the offense had such a big game that it is easy to overlook the fact that the defense did not have a great game. You might focus on the five turnovers, and, and certainly those helped Arkansas win. But, uh, boy, the tackling was not good. The, uh, the, the, the ease with which Mississippi State uh, seemed to move up and down the field for much of the game, uh, I think that's a concern. And this is two weeks in a row now where Arkansas's defense has not played to the level that we expected Arkansas's defense to play to. That, you know, may, maybe said a different way is what you saw in the first half of the season from Arkansas defensively has not been what you've seen the last two weeks against LSU and Mississippi State. Uh, this is what Sam Pippen had to say about the defensive play when he was asked about it yesterday. The great thing is we basically got seven turnovers. We had five and then, you know, the two fourth down that we that they didn't convert. So there is a lot of good things in those, you know, with the second play of the game where we get to sack, fumble by Landon, and then go score. A lot of big things that the defense did. Um, basically, in a nutshell, I didn't think we finished the game in the second half. Uh, our tackling wasn't as good as what it had been in the past. A lot of that goes with Trey. Um, we didn't have as many guys around the ball. Um, you know, we've missed tackles in the past, but we've had somebody else clean it up. And so we'll go work hard on that. Uh, but I was very, very happy with the turnovers that they got and, and uh, the two – big fourth down stops that they that the defense got as well but um we gave up too many explosives so we've got to figure that out and a lot of that was either gap gap being out of the out of the out of the proper gap or our tackling so we've got to work really hard on that this week i feel like football and basketball are in a, in a similar situation this week chip just in terms of the fact that both of them won in a way that may have been a little bit unexpected. And sometimes when you win, it can be hard for a coach to get the attention that, hey, you know what, there, there was a fine line between it being a, an 18-point game and a, a, an eight-point game. Or between a, You think about football, there was a real fine line in winning by 33 and Mississippi State fumbling the ball at the goal line and the Mississippi State receiver throwing the ball in the stands and shotgunning a beer uh, at the goal line when he was out of the one yard line. I mean, if, if Mississippi state doesn't make some of these crucial mistakes in the red zone, all of a sudden Arkansas, they, they still win because their Mississippi state is so bad defensively and Arkansas took advantage of that. But instead of talking about a 33 point win, you're talking about one of these old Southwest conference type scores of like a 58 to 45 type game. Yeah. It's, you know, coaches will tell you it's, it is easier to, have teaching moments after loss because you can point to to areas you know that you didn't do well in. Say, well, you know, if you had done better here, you'd done this, whatever. You know, we we would have won the game. When you win, it it does mask a lot of that. Uh, but the bottom line is, they they did win. Um, and it you know, yeah, there's areas that need to be cleaned up. There's always going to be areas that need to be cleaned up. Um, but they did win, and they had some guys on defense who I thought played outstanding. I thought sorry might have played his his best game mm. all year. I mean, mm -hmm. I thought Saban Sori played a fantastic game um, on Saturday. I thought Landon Jackson, uh, not only, you know, the second play of the game, but he got in, got the, you know, the strip sack, but he was uh, putting pressure on the quarterback the whole game. Um, so I thought there were some bright spots. The back end of the defense did not look good at times. Uh, they had, you know, got some penalties, had trouble, you know, covering some of those, of those quick passes like, you know, like they did against Tennessee. It was kind of the same thing. Um, so, I mean, I, I can see that, but the bottom line is that they got to win. The bubble screens, that's what uh, Pittman said really, really uh, hurt them the other day, including the long touchdown that Mississippi State had for, you know, its first touchdown. Probably three missed tackles on that play, Matt, probably. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, one, and then once he got through, there were some bad angles on the, on the back yeah. end uh, after that running back. Um, this is two games in a row where Arkansas secondaries had some, some struggles. And I feel like that's not a great sign going into an Ole Miss game because, you know, a guy like Lane Kiffin, he's going to be able to scheme, uh, you, know, you know, some things 
against what I guess you know whatever he's seen on on film of Arkansas the last couple of weeks. It's it's uh, I don't have a good feeling about Arkansas defensively. Certainly not what I had about them say three weeks ago whenever they were playing or after what we saw what they did against Tennessee. Well, if you're if your defensive backs are backing off that far, like seven and eight yards off the ball, you know teams are going to take those quick pass those quick out passes over and over until you do something about it. That tells me that their coverage skills are are not that great, and they're afraid that they're going to get beat. So they're not going to come up in press coverage because so they're, they're afraid they're going to get beat on deeper passes. Which, you know, I guess if you look at it, you'd rather give up. Would you rather give up? Would you rather it be death by a thousand cuts of those short passes, or do you want to just give up humongous chunk plays because you tried to come up and press coverage and, and couldn't press the receiver and he gets by you for a fifty yard touchdown? Yeah, it was the death by a thousand cuts. That was the LSU game in a uh, in a nutshell. It was just that little hitch route over and yeah. over and over again uh, that LSU was able to take advantage of against Arkansas. Uh, hey, I want to talk about offensive efficiency here for a minute because I wrote something last week, and I want to follow up on it, that at the time of last week's uh, – uh, or at this time last week, that Petrino's offense uh, was actually less efficient than the offense of Dan Enos through five games against power conference teams uh, last year. And I did note that you know one of the things that Enos had that Petrino has not had is a reliable field goal kicker. And if Arkansas has a kicker that that makes field goals anywhere near the rate that Cam Little did last year, uh, the numbers would be very comparable, like within a, a you know, like, like very, yeah. very comparable. Uh, now, what's interesting to me is that their sixth game was both against Mississippi State. And Mississippi State was not a good defensive group last year, and they held Arkansas to one of the absolute most, I mean, dogpile offensive games we've ever seen. It was, it was ugly uh, last year at Razorback Stadium. And then you juxtapose that against what Petrino's offense did against a defense that is not as good as Mississippi State's defense was last year, and I think that should scare people in Starkville, uh, the fact that, you know, this one is is, is far and away worse than what they had a year ago. This is a historically bad Mississippi State that very defense. Same thing, yes, that very same thing. I tell you what, Matt, hey, and go back and take a look at – let's go back to the LSU game real quick. And I'm not saying – Arkansas wins the game if Taylor Green is able to run, you know, the ball more effectively. But you take a look at what Marcel Reed did Saturday uh, for Texas A&M against LSU, where he was able to have great success, you know, running the football um, against LSU. If Green's able to run the ball, at least be be somewhat of a threat um, in that game, it, it might have been a closer game. You know, Arkansas, I'm not saying they would win. I'm saying it would have been a better showing than, than what they had. Mm -hmm. You know, running is – Hell, it may be, it may be sixty five percent of what he brings to the table, you know. And taking that element away um, was huge in that loss. Yeah, I think so too. Um, going back to efficiency, Arkansas had, um, by my calculation, a six ninety efficiency. Basically, they scored sixty nine percent of all the points that were possible for them against Mississippi State. Uh, that's the highest efficiency for an SEC team since last year when Georgia scored 52 in 10 possessions against Ole Miss, beat them 52 to 17 in that game. This is a, a, a – and obviously the numbers are going to feast on a game like Arkansas had Saturday. Um, you know, statistically, this is going to end up as one of the great offenses that Arkansas has ever had, regardless of, of what their scoring output is. Because think about it, they've had three games now where they've gone over 600 yards against UAPB, against Oklahoma State, and um, – now against Mississippi State. But the point I was going to make was that, uh, you know, I feel like Saturday's game, game six last year versus game six this year against some of the same personnel uh, from Mississippi State, certainly a defense that's one of the SEC's worst last year and is far and away the SEC's worst this year. Uh, that shows you the difference between the coordinators, between Petrino and, and what you had with Enos last year. And I feel like also what it does, Chip, it underscores how bad – they played against Oklahoma State. You go back to that game, and that's a game uh -huh. that I feel like Arkansas is going to be kicking itself from from now to the end of time about not winning that game. They had 648 yards against Oklahoma State. They were moving the ball up and down the field against Oklahoma State the same way they were doing the other day in Starkville. But in that game, they only had 31 points in 14 possessions. The other day, they've got 58 points in 12 possessions. And that's where, I, and, and for anybody who doesn't quite understand what I'm talking about efficiency, that's efficiency. It's scoring points when you're moving the ball 
uh, because yards without points, they don't really mean anything. And so I feel like this the other day was what we didn't see in Stillwater in terms of finishing drives in the red zone, not turning the ball over. And, you know, when when they play a defense that's overmatched, they're going to get some more. Uh, Louisiana Tech's probably going to be overmatched when they play them here in a few weeks in Fayetteville. Uh, this is what this offense ought to look like in those types of games. It should, and a uh, couple of other big key factors in that in that you know win against Mississippi State. Uh, they did they got the tight ends involved in the offense uh, consistently the entire game. The, the tight ends were involved were involved in the offense. They have not been doing a good job with that. It just seemed like Taylor locks in on Andrew Armstrong and. And he's got, you know, other guys open, the tight ends open that hadn't been going to him. So it looked like they made a more concerted effort to get the tight ends more involved. Obviously, they combined for four touchdowns um, in that game. So that was good. And, you know, Matt, they came really, really close to having three backs over 100 yards in that game. Yeah, yeah that, that's right. You realize it was National Tight Ends uh, Day in, in the NFL last Sunday, right? I didn't know that. Oh, man, it, it was – about ten passes Sunday, I guess. Yeah, well, it was, it was all over uh, the the different NFL games that I had on on Sunday. It was a, it's National Tight End Day, and then I saw uh, during the Sunday night game that the uh, there had been more receptions by tight ends on Sunday than any other day in NFL history, which is kind of interesting because you know the NFL they they spread their games out now more. You got a Thursday night game, you got a a, a Monday night game, you had some teams who were on a bye over the weekend, so it's just kind of. I have a feeling that the tight ends were were telling their coaches, "Hey, this is National Tight End Day. Uh, get us involved in the the passing game." But I was thinking about that in terms of like what Arkansas's tight ends did the other day. I mean, Poska caught a couple of touchdown passes. First time we've seen him uh, really involved in the passing game this year. Luke Has looked like the Luke Has that we saw before his shoulder injury um, last season, and now they're going to have those. They're going to have to have those two guys step up with with Gums and Washington out of the picture. Well, they're going to have to have them step up, and they're going to have to have them not get hurt because they don't have, you know, that depth. You lose two guys at one at a position that what though they have five five tight ends, so now they're down to what three. So you know they they can't afford any injuries there, and and both of those guys have been battling injuries. Yeah, you know they they've got some players who uh, you know like a Josh Street, who's also an offensive lineman who can tie you know he can line up as a, a tight end. Uh, they've got the fullback who can line up as a tight end too, kind of an H back fullback tight end. A hybrid, whatever you want to call him. So uh, that's going to be interesting twofold moving down the stretch. Number one, are they going to get their tight ends involved in the passing game more like what they did against Mississippi State? And then, you know, number two, are those tight ends going to be able to to produce? Are they going to be able to stay healthy? Because that's going to be a real key uh, for this team, I feel like, uh, moving throughout the uh, month of November. Uh, one more thought about efficiency, and you can read all of our efficiency ratings right now at wholehawksports.com. Arkansas 10th in offensive efficiency this week in the SEC, 9th in defensive efficiency in the SEC, and 8th in overall team defense or in overall team efficiency, which takes into combination of offensive and defensive play. You know who the number one team in efficiency is? Uh, I'm going to guess Georgia. How about Ole Miss? Ole Miss. Ole Miss. And it's kind of interesting because a lot of people would say, well, they've lost two games. How are they number one in efficiency? They've been really good this year, and you look at their two losses. Their two losses easily could have been two wins. I mean, they're you talk about Arkansas as a play away from beating Oklahoma State, maybe a couple of plays away from beating Texas A&M. Ole Miss legitimately is two plays away. They're 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 three fourth down conversions away from being an undefeated team right now. Kentucky had that big fourth down conversion that helped it on its late touchdown drive to beat them in Oxford, and then obviously LSU had two big fourth down conversions that helped them tie the game and send the game into uh, overtime down in Baton Rouge. I feel like when you look at Ole Miss and you say, well, they lost to Kentucky and they've got two losses, you can really underestimate this team based on how good they are. I feel like they are a lot better than their record shows. Well, they were what, they were in the top 10 when the season started, right? And yeah. uh, you're, you're right. You know, they have two Even up until losses. a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, so – yeah, they're absolutely a legit team. Uh, you know, offensively, you know, they, we know what they are with Lane. Uh, defensively, they they made a concerted effort in the offseason to get better defensively. They, they went through the transfer portal and and got some really really good players there. And and uh, they're playing they're playing much better defensively than they have in the past couple of years. Yeah, I, I think Ole Miss has got a good team. Don't don't sleep on Ole Miss. Arkansas is no ahead of them. 
Arkansas is ahead of them in the they, SEC standings. They may, be, they may be the best team of this Final Four that Arkansas faces. That very well could be true. I mean, because yeah. Texas Texas looks more beatable, I feel like, than Ole Miss does. Yeah. Now, I may no be doubt. wrong on that. You know, <laughs> don't forget I said that I thought Tennessee was their uh, – least winnable game of the remaining home games this year and <laughs> look how that one turned out um Ole Miss even with two losses in the SEC I feel like with enough chaos Ole Miss could slip into Atlanta now I don't know if they're going to do it I just feel like with enough chaos ahead of them uh, that could potentially happen because uh, there's a lot of one loss SEC teams out there I feel like some of these one loss SEC teams have have more losses uh, coming down the pike it, uh, November's going to be fun. It's going to be a lot of fun. And here's the deal for Ole Miss, even if they don't get it to Atlanta. With two losses, I feel like if they win out, they could potentially get to the playoff. I, I feel like they have got the they've got the uh, the reputation to get to the playoff if if they can if they can win out um, and some of the style points. And so it'll be interesting to see you know what that looks like. Here over the uh, the back half of the or, or the the final month of the season, Frank Boyles always said you remember November. Uh, Arkansas, Ole Miss, they both have uh, they have an interesting November lining up for them. Arkansas could they beat Ole Miss? I don't know. I, I've got my doubts. I think they could beat Texas coming off the bye week. I mean Texas. Yes. Yes. You you, you watched Texas. them. They can beat La Tech for sure and Mizzou. 100 percent beatable especially if their quarterback's not able to come back yeah that's right they missouri i don't even know if they look like a well they don't look like a top 25 team to me even with brady cook but boy, when he went out the other day and when he went out against auburn uh, that offense just completely shuts down without him they've got nothing yeah. i listened to a guy on fine bomb yesterday one of the callers and he goes now shouldn't Ole miss i mean i'm sorry shouldn't missouri have a, a uh you know, a high level quarterback and then another high level quarterback behind him. Wouldn't that be the way to go? And you're like, and Fine Bomb's like, that's pretty much what every team tries to do. <laughs> you know, you but gotta, not very many teams can do that. You know, what you have a really, really good quarterback. He wants to play, doesn't want to be the backup. Not very many teams can pay an Arch Manning to sit on the bench or pay a Marcel Correct. Reed or a Connor Wigman, regardless yeah. of, you know, how that goes with AM. Uh, but that's, that's, that's the challenge that teams face. Hey, running back to Quinton Jackson's not going to be available. It look, well, it, it appears that he's not going to be available for this Ole Miss game with that ankle injury. How confident are you in Braylon Russell and and Rashad DeBinion? Uh, and I, I think you got to throw Taylor Green in this conversation too because he's he's a huge part of the running game. How confident are you that they can continue to perform well uh, against these types of defenses they're going to see the next couple of weeks if if, if they can't have Quinton Jackson? It is a big ask um, for a freshman, true freshman, um, you know, to carry the load like this. And um, I think Braylon had 18 carries Saturday against Mississippi State. I think 16, only, only 18. So um, that's not that's not a huge uh, workload um, for a player his size. Um, so you know, I think he'll be fine. Uh, Dominion has looked good. Uh, what is the status? I hadn't seen. What is the status of Rodney Hill this week? They think he'll be able to play. He, I okay. think, again, we're not going to get the availability report until tomorrow, but uh, based on what Pittman said yesterday, it looks like he's going to be listed as probable for the game. That'll be that'll be a tremendous help then. And and uh, uh, Dominion has looked good. He had you know 98 yards the other day, but um, again, fumbling you know was an issue. And how much trust do you put in him? You know, especially in the fourth quarter, if you have a chance to you know to maybe put the hammer on Ole Miss and 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 run clock. You know, how much faith do you put in him in a guy that's that's had some fumbling issues yeah that's right i mean uh the the running here's here's what i keep coming back to if the quentin jackson isn't healthy what's he really going to add to your don't run play. game anyway i mean don't so play him. Yeah. yeah don't play him. yeah so i mean it, it's it's better to get him healthy and see if he can give you something uh down the stretch hey it looks like it's gonna be a rain game saturday have you noticed this you seen the forecast hey, i'm ready for it i'm ready for a good sloppy you know <laughs> A slobber knocker fall football game. That's what I'm ready for. I was thinking about this. It seems like there have been so many Arkansas Ole Miss games in Arkansas, whether it be mostly in Fayetteville, uh, but there was also one in Little Rock that have been rain games. I feel like every time these teams get together, you don't have like this beautiful day. You've either got it raining or it is just bitterly cold outside. The elements always seem to play a little bit of a factor in this game when it's played up here. Now, if it is rainy and cold, I will give the edge on that one to Braylon Russell. I think he's a, a guy, a back that's built for that kind of weather. 
rain has always been an equalizer, right? I mean, that's yes. it, 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 it's kind of interesting. It, it's just an interesting little side, you know, subplot that you've got uh, in this game this weekend for Arkansas and Ole Miss. It's going to be an 11 a.m. kickoff on ESPN Saturday. Hope you come to our website, wholehogsports.com, throughout the week as we continue to preview this. Also, we'll have uh, back to basketball for a minute. We'll have some previews of Arkansas TCU Friday night uh, down in Fort Worth coming up. Anthony Christensen uh, does a great job covering Razorback basketball for us, and he's going to be headed down to Fort Worth uh, for that game on Friday night. No TV for Arkansas TCU. It will be on the radio on the Razorback Sports Network. Uh, we're going to have to get Chuck Barrett one of those uh, graphics to see where he's flying to and from. This is two weeks in a row where he'll call a – a basketball game in one town on Friday night and a football game in a different town on Saturday. It'll be on Razorback uh, Sports Network, but no TV for Arkansas TCU this weekend. Chip, thanks for being here. We'll be back with another podcast tomorrow. Hope you'll join us then. Until then, hope we see you at wholehogsports.com. Have a great day, everyone.